kids, I'm Michael Bain and welcome to Triggered, coming to you as always from the secret hidden bunker in the Rocky Mountains and Dragon House Studios where we're right in the middle of spring. It'd be really great if we could go outside. Okay, soon, soon. This is a follow-up show on this little gun. It is the Ruger LCP-2 in 22 long rifle. Now remember I sort of gave you a quick taste of it when they became available, which is a couple of three months ago, and said I would be spending more time with the gun as, as the summer progressed, which is exactly what I've been doing. And if anything, I am more impressed with the gun now than I was in my first impression. So we'll talk about that just a little bit. Roughly, the gun is a 22 long rifle version of the Ruger LCP-2, which is the third generation of the Ruger LCP light compact pistol that rocked the entire handgun world in 2008 when it was introduced at the SHOT Show. The differences for the LCP-2 and this gun are, LCP-2 is a little heavier, maybe an ounce heavier. The, uh, the initial LCPs were less than 10, 10 ounces, I think 9.3, 9.4. This one is like roughly an 11 ounce pistol, which is still not very big. It's slightly larger than the original LCP. All the LCP-2s are slightly larger. Uh, it has a little bit better sights. Now, I'm not saying that it has good sights, because <laughs> it has pocket pistol sights. But they're good pocket pistol sights. It, um, it has their light racking system. So this is, this is kind of an issue that I believe that Springfield Armory was the first one to really focus in on, is building a gun that was really easy to manipulate. You see Smith & Wesson as well. Because there are people, uh, people of uh, my generation, older people who are dealing with arthritic, arthritic issues in their hands, also dealing sometimes with just lack of upper body strength. And a lot of the small pistols, are, you know, straight blowback pistols, have to have a fairly heavy, heavy string, uh, spring. And so they're hard to rack. So Ruger addressed that with this easy rack system, and it is easy to rack. It's like essentially pulling the, the spring on a ballpoint pen. Uh, they also raised here in the rear serrations, they raised the very back. So when you grab this, you have a good grip. It's not just a slide off grip. Let me see. A, here, this is an original LCP, uh, one of the very first early on first generation. This one with a laser. And, and you can clearly see the difference in the rear of the gun with, this, with the serrations. You can also see the difference in the sights there. Um, so that makes it a little bit of an easier gun to manipulate. You'll also notice here a safety, a manual safety. Now that is a controversial little beast. Manual safety gets really controversial. This particular safety, it's flat and it's designed to be pushed forward. And people are like, well, you know, a 1911 safety goes like this and we got used to this safety that goes like that. The intent of the Ruger engineers was to create a manual safety at the same time making it a manual safety that was uh, intuitive to use. That is, you put your finger on the gun, oh look, Mr. Thumb engages the safety, pushes forward and releases the safety. Uh, part of the reason for, for their intent on having a safety on the gun where they had not had safeties on the previous generations of the LCP is they made a much better trigger. This is a good trigger, which when, when, you, when you get to little guns and you say it's a good trigger, you're kind of like, wow, really? What the Ruger engineers did when they went from the LCP to the LCP-2 they changed the trigger system. It's still a hammer-fired gun. I may have said it's a striker. It's not. I tend to get confused with LC9, LC9S. LC9 is a hammer gun. LC9S is a striker gun. But with the Ruger LC2, it is still a hammer-fired gun, but the trigger system is very similar to what you would find in a Glock. You see the little safety wing down there. And it's uh, on my gauge, a little over six pounds, which you don't want it any lighter on what is, in effect, a pocket pistol. So this gun, I just wanted to give you a quickie like background in pocket pistols as to how we got 
uh, from way back when, the little Colt Jr. 25 caliber automatic vest pocket pistol. If you were a well-dressed man back in the 30s, you know, you might be carrying a Colt 25 semi-auto teeny tiny pistol in your pocket. Uh, of course, from the semi-auto Colts, we ended up going through the uh, uh, C Camp 32 ACPs and then the North American Arms 32 ACPs, a little bit larger. Uh, the benchmark that changed a lot of things with pocket pistols is this guy right here. It's, of course, from uh, my friend George Kelgren, uh, founder of Keltec. Uh, George Kelgren designed this 32 ACP in 1999. And he designed it to be the lightest, easiest to carry pocket pistol in the entire world. And indeed, it was. It weighs like six and a half ounces with, without the trigger, without the laser, that did come uh, standard on them for a while. It's very thin. It's very light. And oddly enough, it's got a double action trigger pull that is not particularly bad. This is a handy little gun to carry. The drawback was it was in 32 ACP. And as we've talked about so many different times, guns go through fashions, caliber go through fashions. 32 ACP was like, well, it's a 32 ACP. Huh, what we really need is a 380. 2008, Ruger says, you want a 380? Hey, you got a 380. I'm very proud to have been a part of this launch with Ruger. We worked very strongly with Ruger to get this, this the LCP, original LCP launched. And a lot of people, and, and gun people, said to me, that, wow, you know what, Michael? <laughs> Who's going to buy that crap? There's a zillion little pistols out there. It's the best-selling launch of a handgun pretty much in our lifetime. I believe by the end of SHOT Show, end of first day of SHOT Show, they had sold something like 300,000 of these guns. They're, they're great, great carry gun. Uh, uh, something that you use all the time. Um, my own personal, and you've seen it before, I'll just mention it here in passing. This is second generation LCP. It's not an LCP2, it's called an LCP Professional, LCP Pro, LCP Premier, but it has a really excellent trigger on it. And it's got a heck of a set of sights. A machined in rear dovetail, you know, sight in the rear. It's got a uh, red dot, or, I'm sorry, a fluorescent dot in the front that's attached via a Glock front sight screw, so you can change it. It has a great sight picture. It has a great trigger. This is why this has become my go-to LCP. And again, it's not an LCP-2. So when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the 22s, pocket pistols in the 22s, and why this gun, the LCP-2, may be the holy grail. This week's Triggered is brought to you by Ammo Man. Now offering $10 off any order of $150 or more with the promo code TRIGGERED. Tandem Cross, making good guns even better. Lipsies and their wonderful Guns of the Month. Lucid Optics, on target, under budget and Franklin Armory, creating some of the most innovative guns in America. Welcome back to Triggered, where today we're talking about the Ruger LCP-2 and 22 long rifle. First segment, we went through a little bit of the history of the LCP series and how that worked. And now, why do I think that the LCP-2 and 22 long rifle is a unicorn, a breakthrough, a great little gun? Well, because it works. The issue always with 22s in a very small platform is reliability. It's the reason when I mentioned the Colt, little Colt Jr., the little Colt Vest pocket gun was in 25 ACP. Why was it in 25 ACP? We've had 22 short and 22 long since the Civil War. Why was the pocket pistol done in a weird caliber like 25 ACP? Really simple because 25 ACP works in a semi-auto pistol. It's a rimless cartridge. The rimmed 22s are a lot more finicky. The only other pocket pistol in 22 that I've ever considered trusting my life to is this one, which you've seen many times before. It's a Walther TPH. And as I've said before, it is in effect jewelry made into a gun. It is as beautiful and as finely machined as anything 
that the German engineers can do, and believe me, the German engineers are really good at this. It has a couple of teeny tiny drawbacks. It's a little heavy. Number two, it's a lot expensive. Number three, the trigger pull is somewhere between hellish and horrific. And number four, it only works with the ammunition that it wants to work with. This gun runs 100% with CCI mini mags, and I have shot thousands through it. It has never malfunctioned. Load it with anything else, and good luck on getting through a magazine. That is typical of the TPHs. So Ruger says we're coming out with a 22, and question A is all righty then. Is it reliable? So I, I wanted to find that out for myself. I put maybe, I don't know, 100 mini mags through the Ruger 22 uh, LCP without any trouble at all. You know, mini mags are hot rounds. They, if, 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 a, if a 22 is going to run with anything, it will typically run with CCI mini mags. So yesterday, I spent the day on the range with a whole bunch of other ammunition and started sorting through it. And on the whole, I was really impressed with using the mini mags. And see, I actually used up the mini mags. But using the mini mags as a control, 10 for 10. Every 10 you load in the magazine, 10 rounds fire, go bang. A little bit sharper because they're mini mags, a little bit hotter around, um, what, 1,200, 1,230 some odd feet per second. But pretty good choice if you're looking at it in terms of maybe a potential self-defense round. I think what surprised me overall with 10 different brands of ammunition was how well the gun ran consistently with a lot of them. Obviously, mini mags is a standard. CCI makes a standard velocity ammunition. I have a lot of it. Um, I loaded up the standard velocity ammunition, 10 for 10, 10 for 10. Not a problem. The, the standard velocity CCI ran without problem in this gun. Secondly, and this is an ammunition that I totally, totally, totally did not expect to do well, <laughs> this is Wolf match target ammunition. It's very accurate. However, my experience with it has been, uh, it has a tendency to see failures to fire from light primer strikes. Uh, the Wolf see, uh, centerfire primers are pretty much like concrete blocks, right? But the ammo is accurate, but a lot of my target pistols do not like it. So I loaded up 10 in the magazine on this, ran like a top, continued running like a top. No failures of any kind with the Wolf target ammunition, which was a surprise to me. So then I started sifting through um, to Fiocchi. Fiocchi's a go-to ammunition. We've used it you know, a zillion times. At various times they've been ammo sponsors, they're not now. But uh, my friend Tim Norris in, in uh, Rampart Challenge Shooting Association, who's a champion in, in that sport, only uses this Fiocchi ammunition. Um, this Fiocchi ammunition had a couple of problems with the 22 LCR. I had one failure to feed, and the gun locked back. Now, because the gun locked back, I am not willing to say that's an ammunition failure to feed. Because it, it doesn't take much with a finger dragging on the slide or your finger riding a little too close to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the slide release, which is, this is a little bit larger slide release than, say, the LCP. So, because the slide locked back, I'm willing to at least consider that my wayward thumb caused that to happen. But there was one failure to feed, and it, it happened on, I think, the third round, and then the next seven rounds, no problem. However, what made it really irritating was with the Fiocchi, it managed to pitch the hot brass all up my arm and bounced one off my face. Just the way it ejected, because I found myself going like, ouch, ouch, ouch. Every time I pull the trigger, I caught hot round. That's the only ammunition where, with, uh, with this particular uh, ejector that it pitched it onto me. Uh, various and sundry, uh, go-to cheapo ammo, Bitterroot Valley. I had, with Bitterroot Valley, I had one failure to feed, and it was not me. These are, are hollow point rounds, and the hollow point rounds set a little higher in the magazine. And so on the fifth round on the first magazine with this, the, the bullet caught right at the top of, of the magazine, the, uh, sorry, the barrel, the hood of the barrel. 
and I saw that as, as a, a semi-consistent problem. So Bitterroot was probably the least reliable the ammo we ran through it. Uh, did I plain old Winchester, silver box, standard velocity, 10 for 10. You know, no, no drama. Ely, oddly enough, which I'm not surprised, Ely Contact is a match ammunition. It's very, very accurate. Even in this gun, you know, I have a 25-yard plate, and, and even with the little bitty sights, you can kind of sit there with the Ely and shoot that 25-yard plate. In fact, I have a 90-yard plate, uh, which I hit three out of four times with the Ely ammunition. Um, on the other hand, I, I did have one failure to fire, one light primer strike. And I didn't run the round through again, but it was just clearly it was hit. It was a light primer strike. That was the only light primer strike I had in this on this, you know, this ammunition. It was actually the only light primer strike I had in the afternoon of shooting this gun. Um, kind of roll on through uh, Arms Corps, which I don't have a box of it here, but Arms Corps is a, a uh, has been a sponsor of Shooting Gallery for, for off and on many years. They're uh, going to be a sponsor for MichaelBain.tv very soon. I have shot a lot of Arms Corps ammunition, Arms Corps ball, and uh, it works fine. 10 for 10, which is what I would expect. Um, SK Standard. SK is super premium ammunition. Gummy is all, all get out, 10 for 10. Here's the surprise, okay? Ta-da! Ta-da! A couple of surprises. Well, Federal Premium Target, 10 for 10. This surprised me. This is, this is one of my favorite ammunitions in the whole world. It's Gemtech Subsonic. It's designed for suppressors. It does not make you know, the 1100 feet per second sound barrier, so you don't get that crack, right? I have found it to be super accurate ammunition in my pistols and my rifle. In fact, shooting, Rimfire Challenge Shooting Association, this is typically my choice of ammunition for Rimfire Challenge Shooting Association. Um, because it's going at a slower velocity, there's a little less recoil, a little less blast. It's accurate. It'll shoot super groups. And it will do exactly the same thing in this gun. I fully expected this ammunition to choke because of its velocity. It didn't. 10 for 10 on that. So what we're seeing here is a 22 pocket pistol that's reliable. It's reliable with lots of different ammunition. Why would you choose this over a 380? It has no recoil, effectively, especially with something like CCI, standard velocity, or the standard velocity CCI or the Gemtech. It doesn't have any recoil. It's accurate. And you've got 10 rounds, 10 plus 1 in the magazine. Now, I will go back to my mentor Walt Rausch's statement every single time. No one likes to leak. The more holes you put in someone, the less likely they are to continue their aggression. And it doesn't matter what size those holes are. So very impressed with the LCP2, very impressed with the reliability of it. If you get this gun and you are going to carry it, and I think it's, I'm going to carry it on my bicycle because I think it is a great dog gun, a great pest gun. And potentially, you know, if I have to use a 22 in self-defense, I'm prepared to do it. But you need to do the same test I did. Start with mini mags. Don't start with crap. You can get cheap ammunition. You can get ammunition that is so cheap you would not believe it. And the reason it is cheap is that it's crap. But people call me and they say, you know, I got like 50,000 rounds of this ammunition for $1.85 and a couple of puppies. And it doesn't run in my gun. <laughs> Duh. Anyway, do the test yourself. Start with Mini Mag. Work your way down. I'm Michael Bain. This is Triggered. You can find us on michaelbain.tv, where you'll also find the Best Defense Survival Roundtable and michaelbain.tv on the radio podcast. You can also find us on YouTube. Uh, and soon, I keep telling soon, the virus has slowed the entire country down. But soon, we'll be available in lots of other places. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next week. Get ready, big boar fans. Lipsy's next gun of the month is definitely for you. It's a stainless steel Ruger Super Blackhawk in 44 Magnum. So far, pretty common. But the Lipsy's touch includes a 3.75 inch barrel, 
Bisley grip frame, which really helps absorb the kind of recoil that you can get out of some of the hottest 44 Magnum loads. And believe me, a Super Blackhawk can handle any of those loads. It comes with super black laminate grips. They look excellent on the stainless steel and an unfluted cylinder, once again, proving that Lipsy's not only knows how to make super powerful, super easy to pack guns, but boy, do they have a sense of style. Lipsy's Gun of the Month, Super Blackhawk Bisley, 44 Magnum.